Small Business Plan 326 B Tunbridge School Kent, 1994 Bring them before us. Bring the ghastly peasants before us. Let us feast off of them. The poor. The scholarships. Bring this wondrous institution into disrepute with their tracksuits and monster munch. The dirty. The hideous. Bring them before us. Their only worth is to be used by their betters. This world of ours has no place for them. Let them get their grubby little GSCEs in their provincial schools. Let them not dilly, nor dally with our kind. Let us burgle their innocence the words of the chief mole sent terror into the hearts and minds of the four scholarship boys the second they were uttered. Treated as inferior from the outset, despite their academic brilliance, due to the fact that their stock was not, well, what was desired. The mole indicated to the minor moles that they begin their endeavor, lowering the boys to rousers. Boys who were mostly bigger than their buggers yet with fear bearing down on them from above, they meekly allowed themselves to be jostled into a position. Thirty moles lined up excitedly, with their keenness and obvious protuberance, as the four products of the grammar school system felt the violation of their working class buttocks time and time again. Pain and disgust fought to be the prominent emotion as their dignity ebbed away like the blood from the fissures trickling down their legs. Alex wanted to close his eyes. Alex wanted to close his mind. Alex wanted his ass to somehow close itself. But with every thrust, his sphincter seemed to conspire further against him, and allow more and more of his torturous girth inside him. When the assailants were finished with their undertaking, they forced to fore, to wash themselves clean with flannels with the school logo emblazoned on them. Alex promised to avenge this day before he died. London, England 2016 The pre-section his office looked like a detective's hovel from a case impossible to solve. Photos covered the walls joined by retarded spiders web of with pins and strings that allowed Alex to make the necessary connections to bring together that unfortunate team, that inamorous quartet, that sullied collection of beings. After that night there were others, they hurt less, in terms of pain, but they hurt more. In terms of hurt, Dot Alex's motivating motif over these years had been revenge. Inevitably, it shaped him and twisted him more than the thrusts of his hideous assailants. He had followed their lives with the same interest as he had done with his fellow Gudgeons. Of course, the perpetrators were easier to find than three sad figures who scalped away from Tunbridge with no better A level results than they would have obtained from their local comprehensive. Thus, proving that the granting of such scholarships, was folly as boys of that ilk could not enjoy the fineries of life, they were not equals, they were simply playing a trying, to fit into a world, that didn't need them or want them. The focus of his revenge, was where his work would hinge. He could not simply knock off thirty exalted and imposing figures who would, in the public size, at least, be sorely missed. He discovered that there was no way, to repay them the pain they had caused, not them individually, their crimes would go unpunished and they would live their lives under the belief that their doings were free of wrong, little more than a lesson for the oiks, school stuff, good lord, it was twenty years ago, even more, water under the bridge now laddie. If they still have a chip on their shoulder about the event then it just goes to prove they were all bad eggs. Therein lied the rub. To somehow cause pain to people who felt nothing. He had tried and failed to enter, and disrupt their lives. He tracked down one of his attackers, and made amorous approaches to his wife, with the full intention of making him feel as useless, and unwanted as Alex had felt on that and those nights. It didn't work, when the moment came to consummate the deal, that would give rise to the blackmail, he froze, as he always froze in the sphere of sexual love. That dead part of his soul unable to return from its early grave. This is the reason, why it took him more than two decades to concoct a plan, that would repay some of the pain that he had endured. More so lately, he lay awake wondering whether it would really be worth it. Would his actions change anything? Did his suffering really matter? Lots of awful stuff happens every day. Why was he special? But every time he saw how the lot who tortured him paraded around the streets of London, his belief that something had to be done was reaffirmed. Section A, in search of reunion Alex, assumed the other three would want in on this. It was their right too, after all. They had suffered just as much as him, and deserved the right, to bask in the glory once the wonderful plan had been deemed a success. At this juncture, merely a simple pair of issues thwarted the foregoing, he didn't have a plan, and he didn't know the whereabouts of the others. 
the internet would help him in this quest, and before he even had a chance to sip his freshly made coffee, he discovered that one of the four was already no more. Barry was found in a bed sit in 2002 with a needle hanging out of his arm, what the press entitled an accidental overdose due to the stress of the court case he was involved in. Court case. Barry, were you trying to make amends? Indeed he was. He had coaxed three of the vile rapists to confess boast about their doings, after they took him into their confidence, after promising them a never-ending stream of lovely boys, some characters marry, and live respectable lives, yet their most sordid dealings will always find a way back onto their agendas. Barry was convinced he had enough to take down at least two of them for a long time, when at the earliest stage of the proceedings a judge, a personal friend of one of the families, dismissed the case on the grounds of entrapment. A few days later Barry was found dead. A clean living boy who apparently hid a heroin addiction over years. The coroner's report stated that it was a single, high dose that killed him, and that his metabolism was not consistent with long-term users, but the judge decided not to bear this in mind. It's all there, in white and white on the internet, the truth, anyone can see how this was a fit-up, yet nobody cares. Nobody does anything. The judge said this, we think this. The other two took longer to find. Mark had changed his name, and was living in Canada in a commune. They had renounced all forms of modern communication, and could only receive notice from the outside world via the medium of dance. I resolved to inform him once the revolution had been a success in the appropriate manner. Alan was still living in London, but was reticent to meet. I managed to persuade him, and we set a date for the next day. The last time I had seen Alan, his fear-stained glance penetrated my gaze almost as much as my rear assailant's thrust. For years I saw that face, filled with dread, every night as I fought the demons towards sleep. His face becoming mine as I closed my eyes until the fear forced them open again. I didn't recognize him at first, somehow expected him to look the same as before like the fucker would appear in the school uniform almost. After the two of us sitting at the end of the bar for fifteen minutes in an empty pub, sidled over and said Alan, there was a kind of laugh, not to know how incredibly funny this is just the beginning of a wonderful night kind of laugh, but to laugh, nonetheless. I apologized and said I hadn't recognized him. He told me he knew I was Alex, but was in a hurry to start this. We sought out a table. I guess there is no real need for a how the hell have you been interlude? I began, I want to do something to them, hurt them like they hurt us. Make them stop. Are you in? I pleaded. How? Was his simple response. I don't know yet. Was my pointless one. You can only hurt something that feels pain. You know that. Oh, you could turn up with four mates and pummel one of them, maybe even kill them. But you would never get away with it. And, indeed, isn't the only way to make them feel the hurt we felt to do the same to them? What do you suggest? Rape their children? Alan said. No. I mean of course not. I just want I tried to explain. You don't know what you want. Until you do, you will never be free of this. Those nights made me what I am, for bad or for worse. I knew I could never escape from this destiny. That's what I told Barry, when he came for aid. I have become just as soiled as our posh chums. For a while after school I was a type of Mr. Mistress for a couple of them, others vying over my attentions, with a hefty allowance for the price of my silence. But time passes for us flowers, and stems wither, and petals fall. Their tastes never age. My role then became the provider of the provided. Seeking out my replacements. The hefty fee remained, and I have enough dirt on them to cause a scandal, maybe even a ruckus, but they won't do time. You must know that. You are asking the system that they control to judge them and sentence them. They could be filmed getting a blow job off a boy on one of the lions in Trafalgar Square and they would not set foot in a prison. I'll live a wealthy death whilst I'm alive on this planet. I do hope there is no one to answer to when I leave it, which will be soon, as I am dispensable and they have the means to dispose of me. Leave it, Alex. I did not expect that. I'll admit that is not how I envisaged that this would go. I need to think, if you insist on doing something, it has to be massive. You will die as a result of your actions. For us though that is not a concern as we have not been alive for years. I assume you are equally dead on the inside. 
Shall we go through the rigmarole of the meaningless questionnaire? Married? Children? Lover? Close friends? Any meaningful contact with the human race? Of course not. If you had, you would not be here, and as you haven't, you can only be here. Alan continued. What do you mean massive? I was coming across as a brainless fool. Storm the Winter Palace, in time for the hundredth anniversary. Make enough of them hurt to appease your pain. Thousands might do something, but it will be a hollow victory, if you win. Don't expect any revelation. I read your book by the way, Absolute Drivel, totally transparent and obvious. You are clearly hiding all of your life experience and writing some made-up toss you don't feel. Top up. Alan smiled. That was definitely a change of tack. He was right, about my plan, or lack of it, about not going to change anything, about my book, and about the drink. My shout, same again? I asked. We talked for another hour. He told me of happy memories from Tunbridge. He told me of happy afternoons spent in the arms of men who had once been thieves of his affections who now laughed like lovers. He told me that insofar as was possible, he had not let those nights ruin his life, despite the fact that they were present on a daily basis. He was a heterosexual virgin and a homosexual whore. His parting advice was to make them feel like they controlled everything and were getting something far, far beyond the reach of the mundane. We promised to keep in touch and raised a glass to Barry. We forgot Mark. Said as let's dance filled the bar with music. And we did. Then we parted. Section B, in search of a plan massive. I jotted down Alan's advice, and cursed the swine as a crypt griddle fruit as the words on the page stared back at me tauntingly. I kept hearing the word massive in my head. In no time, it took on a meaningless and imbecilic form. It sounds mocking my brain as it pulled me desperately towards some sort of idea. I made myself a coffee and returned to the matter of paying the bills. I had a couple of invites in my inbox. The book I mentioned had been a great success. It is piffle, undoubtedly, but the kind of piffle that sells, the kind of piffle that gets made into a film with the blonde off friends, and whichever chisel jawed Hollywood Muppet is en vogue at the time. Just as my ass was public domain at school, my art also is for the world to enjoy. I tell myself that I am capable of surpassing Heart of Darkness or Catch one day, but in the meantime, this seven-figure income helps abate the pain. For some reason, I have been invited to give a short reading at Glastonbury between sets. I have not heard of either of the artists who have requested me, though if they consider my writing to be of any worth, then their music must be far from enjoyable. They really are a license to print money these festivals. It always looks so much better on the telly. The reality is misery in mud surrounded by it read for human beings who are less interesting high than sober. Then, the word massive returned. The word massive was ready to show me what it could do. Imagine a festival only for rich kids. I mean super rich kids, not someone who would work all summer and scrimp to pay for tickets. Kids who have so much wealth that it would not matter if you charged them a ton or a million for a festival. Indeed, the more it cost, the more likely they would be to want an exclusive. No riffraff. I believe that this could be the prime to an idea. Why did I never use words like that in my books? Quite simple, this is the story I want to be read. Section C, a plan comes into being this is how it happened with my last novel. Sitting around for a bit doing nothing. Idea. Outpour. Product. Profit.it's, that is it or sell 8 million copies of Piffle. More people have read my pitiful works than they have those of most of the people who inspired me to put pen to paper in the first place. My biggest break was the general stupidity and lack of need for artistic fulfillment on the part of my readership. Anyway, since the moment of inspiration I have managed to use my considerable and undeserved fortune to good use. The more I think about it, the more I see the similitudes in what happened to me in that delightful 17th century vaulted room was simply a less literary version of what I do to my readers. To save space here, I will outline the basics of my plan. I have organized a festival that will take place on the luxurious island of Vova, a popular spot with the wealthy. This will not be your typical mud and tents type festival. Everything will be super luxury, oh god I can't even write it. Of course, it won't be. 
I will fool them into thinking they are getting the experience of their lifetime, whilst giving them the experience of their lifetime. Stay with me, it'll be worth the ride. They think they will be spending time with models and rock stars, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The rules are simple, the festival is only open to successfully profiled rich kids, between 18 and 25, kids who have never worked a day in their life, nor are likely to. Kids who have never wanted for anything but who will soon offer their fortunes for a sip of water and an air ticket home. It might bankrupt me, it might kill me, but it will be fun. The first thing to do was drum up interest. I got a good friend of mine, Tony, to do some marvelous work with the computer, to put together a fake, yet convincing package offering five-star accommodation, fine dining and a lineup that the cool kids would kill for, i.e. no one you've ever heard of as we created their coolness, they are all the next hottest thing. You've never heard of them? Where have you been living? None of them would ever admit that they had no idea who they were going to say, let alone that they might be wrong about their magnificence. If you are not cool enough to be one step ahead of the game, you are not welcome here. Anyone can see an artist who has sold 10 million records. Do artists still sell records? Oh, I'm cool, too. The art is in seeing them before everybody else. The Emperor's new, diamond-encrusted iPod, so to speak. So, with the lineup in place, artists paid a 20 grand appearance fee for not turning up, and fake brochures showing the lap of luxury. It was time to advertise. Here we got real models to upload Instagram photos of themselves checking out the festival site on a pre-festival reconnaissance mission. Of course, we just sent them to some wonderful location and had them posing in bikinis in the sort of place your average rich kid would love to spend a weekend in like-minded company. We had to make certain that the people in attendance would only be people worthy of such treatment. We did not want someone scrimping and saving to get a ticket, selling their wares to get a spot on the coveted plane. Quickly, we devised a vacuousness certificate which had to be compulsorily completed by applicants to be granted a ticket. This certificate covered various aspects of the brat's upbringing, namely to expulsion from a major private, public, educational establishment, verified parental assets in excess of 10 million GBP, never having worked a single day, disciplinary proceedings resulting from abuse of power bullying, narcissistically active on social media, proven distaste for the lower classes and the tiebreaker, why they should be allowed to attend the festival. As you can imagine, the responses became rather competitive as we announced that we had been flooded with applications. Of course, we hadn't. People were still not taking us seriously, though a minor snowball was in evidence, and that we would have to be highly selective on who was allowed to attend. We offered early applicants the chance to redo their certificates, to have a better chance of getting in. Before we move on to the description of the actual festival, well the description they were given, the actual festival will be somewhat different. I'd like to share with you one of my favorite application forms. Name. Luxurious wig but smithed to Haviland Richmond Brighton educational background. Failed every subject at Eton despite knowing the answers. Made daddy make an extra contribution of four million pounds to have them pass me and leave the place and did a huge stud in the font in the chapel. Parental income. Father's personal fortune in excess of one billion GBP disciplinary issues. Regularly abuse staff at home from hideous places such as, like I can remember the names of these hovels and other hellholes. I enjoy the systematic abuse of working class prostitutes, particularly pretending that I will take them away from the horrible life they are suffering, only to leave them pregnant and on crack. Currently I have notched up 27 victims of this sort. As far as I know, I have been involved in two drink-driving incidents that resulted in deaths. Both times they were lower end scum or foreign with no chance of legal counsel equivalent to my own. Employment history. None. No intention to work. Social media scalps. Average of 38.2 retweets per tweet. More than 1 million likes on Instagram. Had Cristiano or Ronaldo like a photo of me in my swimming trunks. Why should I be allowed to attend? Because I am more essential to the success of your event than anyone else on this planet. Without me this event is nothing. Any social gathering without my presence is a mere expression of peasant vulgarity. Really you should pay me to go, but money has no meaning, so I would gladly pay double. 
I genuinely can't wait to get out there and show those darkies what for. We said in the publicity leaflet that all of the staff had a curious disorder that meant they actually enjoyed being abused rather than treated well. In fact, I will make you an offer of 20 million GBP now for 10 of my friends to attend. What does it matter? Daddy can make that while I'm away. There were worse ones too. Dot you'd be surprised how imaginative people can get when pushed. Once we had applications of this nature, to be fair to Yuxurius, his backing did pull in some big name fools, plus his 20 million more than paid for the event. He transferred the money without the standard buy nor leave, and interest was starting to increase. The plan was for the last weekend in May, it was now February and freezing, so some nice promotional sunshine videos were needed. I now had enough money to employ a full-time team to create the effect of the festival, and another to plan the actual events that would take place on the island. This is what they were signing up for. Exuberant elite festival the time has come to enjoy more than just a festival. The time has come to enjoy an expression of who you really are and how your entourage wishes to make the most of surroundings beyond the grasp of so many. No more queues, no more endless lines, to eat tasteless vegetarian burgers, no more smelly tents, the time has come to forget tryst bands, if you are on the island you are part of the festival, if you are part of the festival, the festival is you. Mingle with the bands, mingle with the crowd, that makes you proud, share your moments, join our elite team on our private island in the Maldives location hidden until you are accepted. Travel from London on one of our specially charted luxury Emirates jets, first class falls short of the description of how you will be treated from start to finish, forget about everything you have enjoyed beforehand, it's time for elite class. Revel in the marvellous accommodation as you sip lovingly poured cocktails, whilst the freshest acts of tomorrow reaffirm your elite status as a mover and guru. A once in a lifetime opportunity to be fashion itself, to define the paths that less immortals will follow in coming years. Do you really want to miss out on this unique chance? If you have received this mail then you have already been handpicked in the initial phase. You are invited to complete your certificate and request admission. Price for the weekend. 350,000 GBP does not include transfer to Gatwick Airport. We sent this out to over 300 people and got back 180 positive responses once the video channel was up and running on YouTube and we roped in shameless rap star Jazz Beck along with his selection of charming female friends from his latest video. JP signed an NDA, but as a chap from the ghetto he was more than keen on the plan's ethos, whilst eating $40 hamburgers in a limo with platinum interiors. Things moved so fast from the end of February onwards. To maintain the pretense, we hacked into the system of one of the finest hotels in the region, and periodically sent our victims emails and updates on their luxury accommodation. Further artists were added to the lineup, people who did not exist, people who had managed for downloads on iTunes yet were promised as the next big thing, and the odd one we threw in for a laugh. We got to making things a little spicier for the attendees by having the Instagram models to individually contact some of the needier-looking lads to set up meetings once they were on the island. No one questioned anything, we were meticulous with our preparations, and even managed to forge licenses to hold the festival and mock-ups of the stage layouts. With the rest of the money, we put together the real package that awaited them on the North Atlantic island of Papi, just off the coast of Iceland. Delightfully uninhabited and remarkably inhospitable, even in May, the island will prove the test of their courage and guile as they try to survive in flip-flops. For the sum of 5 million GPB, we have the island from the end of October until two days after the festival to clean up. Our team is installed there are we speak to create an unforgettable experience. Section D, to the airport. It was important that they did not suspect anything untoward. We were dealing with thick people, but you should never make the assumption that the people are quite as thick as you believe. Giving them extra reasons to believe they were vastly superior to the other proles crawling pathetically around the airport was paramount to the spectacle. We also held briefing meetings at the Ritz with lavish cocktails and overpriced pointless canips. These were calculated expenses that still fell within the budget as we had 230 confirmed guests not including Yuxurius 20 at a million a throw. That meant that if we could stay within the budget of Big U's 20 million, 
we could still make 50 million from the event. The money would be divided in an equal manner, with all participants receiving a handsome amount for their endeavors, with the remainder being used for social causes close to my heart. Ideally, many of the revelers would undergo a change of heart that would cause them to renounce their fortunes to the benefit of society as a whole. However, that may be a trifle optimistic. We added the bit about airport transfers not being included just to annoy them. Most had no issue getting to Gatwick as they were largely based in the south of England. Maybe in the future, we will have time to expand to rip vengeance on our European elite, but for the meantime, we were happy with our little band of pasty faced floppy-haired, homegrown twats. Despite my impetus for this venture being based on my own rape as a schoolboy, we were clear from the outset that there would be no repayment in the form of buggery, a front buggery for the ladies, let us not overlook the fact that the act of being at what is necessarily always the domain of the male, there is still a great deal on offer even with that hideous act discarded. We set aside a VIP suite at Gatwick, whilst the plane was prepared. Once we were in the air, and about an hour from Iceland we could drop the masquerade. For now, it was party face time and any whim they had, we would be delighted to fulfil. And so, it began. We had meat in the VIP lounge. Some of them acted like that was the equivalent of slurping seal semen from the boot of a Turkish athlete. A chef with two, as in one twice, Michelin stars, was entrusted with the role of keeping their sensitive little tums from rumbling, but alas, this was not enough. They accused him of producing little snacks and a chef, as sensitive as all artists, took this affront rather badly and stormed off, leaving his deconstructions without direction or a bellini, to soak up the sauce. Ironically, they were forced to soak up the bubbly with packets of crisps from the machine as no one in attendance knew how to turn the ingredients into morsels of joy. At least they only had an hour in the VIP lounge before making their way to the plane. This was another expensive outlay that pulled violently on the budget, but it was worth it. The Emirates A380 is rumoured to be a fine example of aviation technology. I will not know for the time being as I am monitoring things from the London Ho with my team of hate, sorry I meant eight, assessors. I had a spy on the A380 who would record the events and relay them onto me, so that I could verify for myself the worthwhile nature of the expense. They will land at Akureyri Airport in the north of Iceland. Obviously an A380 landing at airport of those dimensions would cause rumblings in the pants of local spotters and so we have had to pay extra to close the airport, despite the fact that during our slot there are no commercial flights scheduled, transfer from the plane to the island will be one of the key points of the adventure. They must believe at the beginning that they have merely been the victims of misfortune, they are not being kidnapped, not yet. Things have just got off to a rather disappointing start. Another nice touch has been to install a kind of digital anti-communicator. My it guy came up with the term, that will simply bounce their social media quibbles off the island, and store them indefinitely, whilst giving them the impression, that they had been posted, yet none of their followers had reacted, liked or shared their post. A truly painful thing, to inflict on such vanity. Section A, on forming the team. I had to have people I could trust. I had to have people who had been through the same or similar, and understood my motivation. I needed hatred. After my failed attempts, to bring on board my fellows from that night of initiation, I made contact easily enough through forums, where people were happy to share their grief online. Obviously, an NDA was required, but I was careful in my selection process, and was pretty sure I had pressed the right buttons from day one. Salaries were outrageous for the amount of actual work that needed to be done. In organizing the festival itself, the hardest tasks required the skills of exami staff that would create a living hell and lessons to be learned. I appointed as my number two Jennifer, she had been a music company runner at the start of her career, and felt the rough sort of abuse from inside the industry. The attacks on her were never of a sexual nature, most of the people who took advantage of her nature failed to notice even her gender. She was just seen as an it whose purpose was to serve them, to suffer humiliation, and to grind down taking a piece of her heart and soul every day. When she tried to complain about these incidents, even those close to her circle made her feel like she was exaggerating, as if she was simply oversensitive, and that she should knuckle down, and get on with things, 
if she wished to make a career out of the trade into which she thrust herself against the will of her parents. Every day was a slog, and she knew that everyone laughed at her, wanting her out, continually taking advantage of every opportunity to recreate a type of initiation ceremony to see how far she would go, to see just when she would crack. But crack she didn't, she withstood swathe after swathe of attacks, gradually building up from minor insults to the downright abuse. Yet, it was a game stumbled upon by some of her supposed superiors, that spelt her final days in the industry. For an entire twelve-hour shift, the six-strong management team she'd been assigned to pamper pretended to want tea. That was it. Every time that she brought them the requested beverage, they acted like they had never made any such request. This was then posted on social media with the hashtag number don't employ Jenny. This happened 14 times on her last day. The last time, she had the kettle in her hand with scalding water ready to be launched onto their smarmy faces. But she stopped to herself. She was not going to do time for them, despite the obvious joy at being able to disfigure them. She unplugged the kettle, folded her apron and left. Her contract was so meaningless that she did not even need to serve notice. It took about a week for anyone to realize she was no longer turning up. She returned to her parents, where she stayed until I stumbled upon her. The other part of the management dream virate was Sebastian, ex-army officer who expected his privileged background to assist him in his quest up the military ladder. This plan was scuppered as he fell foul of the general under whose auspice he was attached. This was no game of unrequited love, simply that Seb was extremely disliked by the man. When the latter was questioned as to why, he could give no convincing reason as to why, just that there was something about him. What the general really wanted was a colored person to abuse. Sadly, for him, he never got one so had to make do with Sebastian. This involved him forming a torch squad and making Seb do a manner of horrible things in the name of allegiance to the crown. Despite his victim being wholly willing, the general still wanted more and forced Seb to black up, whilst accepting his abuse. Again, there was no violent snap, Seb figured his career in the military, had come to an end and allowed for a spate of negligent accidents finally bringing about his discharge. His bully soon turned his attentions to another victim and Seb was soon stacking shelves in the local Aldi, but free. The fact that neither of them had gone on a Hungerford-style rampage was important to Alex. It meant that they had shown restraint, and that they would be willing to see this task through. The idea was not to hurt the rich kids, well maybe a little, but to make some of them suffer, and make others think. An idealistic crusade, if you like. Jenny and Seb were entrusted with finding people in a similar position of having survived abuse and keen on revenge. Part of the filtering process was to weed out potential lunatics who might have too much fun during the festival. The idea was that this would be more like dantric sex than a quick rummage in the closet. There was money in place, to pay attention to detail. There was time, there was remoteness. There was a victory in the offing. Section F, this is your captain speaking. Akureyri Airport had no commercial flights scheduled for the day our aircraft arrived. The runway was not used to vehicles of such girth, so landing was something of a bumpy affair, a bumpy affair made deliberately worse by the skills of the pilot. With a nice pervading odor of vomit and the odd scream, those inside were forced to wait on the tarmac for an hour due to an unforeseen issue with the doors. When they were finally allowed out, their attire in tune with the island on the Maldives they thought they would be partying on, was in no way fitting for midnight in northern Iceland in October. None had anything in their cases that would have helped them in such a predicament, even if the luggage was with them. During check-in, they were treated to a VIP service that offered to load their cases for them free of charge, so that the festival goers could tuck into the treats on offer. These cases were sent to a homeless shelter, where all of the useless items, that is, Almost all of them were placed on a bay to raise funds for the shelter. The wind ravaged the steps of the plane as they fought their way down in flip-flops and sandals. There was no lighting on the runway, an expensive bonus paid for by us, and they struggled to make it to the terminal building. Amongst the revelers were incognito festival staff who acted as impromptu guides and self-appointed leaders to help those feeling somewhat shell-shocked. These were equipped with body cams so that Ho was able to watch, and broadcast, though not yet live, events unfold. 
it was important not to let panic turn into mayhem too soon. Of course, Alex and the team wanted the experience to be as ghastly as possible, but things had been planned, and it would be a shame to miss out on all these aspects of psychological torture. Meanwhile, on a delightful island in the sun, a group of bronze twenty-somethings posted photos next to models and live footage of rapper Zippy Tut's seminal performance. The general consensus was that the festival lacked organization, but was generally a success. Certainly there was nothing to make people show any concern for a group of rich kids who had to suffer meat instead of Bollinger. The world soon forgot about the festival as the next news item came around. The head of the group made it to the terminal building and the relative shelter of inside. The space had been rented until 5 a.m. the next day, the first flight out was at 1100, so the entertainment could begin undisturbed. They found the building abandoned. There were no reps from the festival, and no means of transport. All they found, was a message saying, that there had been technical issues, and that buses would come to take them to the festival site at the earliest juncture. Tempers began to flare, and here the work of the infiltrated revelers, came to a fore. Calming down people in danger of going too far, whilst making it clear that this was not acceptable, the team had managed to intercept and bug all of the attendees' social media accounts, so when they posted the reality of their hell in the airport, their posts were visible to the outside world as harmless twaddle on what a great time they were having in the sun. That first night for many was the worst night of their lives. Order could only be maintained in pockets. There was one infiltrated guard for every 30 partygoers. Alex and the team were surprised to see how quickly the human spirit wanes and the weak are consumed. Official guests numbered 250. That was the final number that boarded the plane and set off for the sun. Unfortunately for them, it was the midnight sun. It actually four hours for the first of them to actually check their GPS and discover their true location. Once word spread that they were in Iceland they tried to make it to the doors and back onto the plane. A doors were locked fast, and could only be opened via the main computer. As they stared into the darkness, they saw how the runway lights were switched on, and the plane began to taxi out of its barked position. The banging on the doors, was as incessant as it was pointless, even when the plane was in the air, they continued to scream for it to take them back, only stopping when its lights could no longer be seen in the night sky. The plane made hastily for Reykjavik for a thorough clean, and a well-deserved night's rest for the crew. Despite the guard's best intentions, Seven did not make it through the first night. There was mention of rape, and mention of retribution. Two more tried to climb their way out, and fell to their deaths. The corpses lay on the ground next to those who managed to achieve sleep. Alex gave the orders for one of the guards, to activate a gap in one of the impenetrable windows so that the duty-free shop could be accessed. The only part that could be reached was that with the liquor, no food, just booze, fuel for mayhem. That led to the death of another three inner fighters. two other guards foolishly let a couple of knives slip onto the table. These were hastily recovered as Alex made it clear that things were already out of hand. Transporter arrived at 0430 and took the weary and drunk onto uncomfortable buses. The guards formed groups to take the corpses onto the buses, forcing the others to believe that their actions had been captured on video, and the authorities would send them to jail if they did not cooperate fully from now on. These groups were then ordered from the employed guards downwards, the latter choosing cohorts to fulfill tasks, though the most valued skill was the exercising of muscle. The remainder was huddled on two airport buses that sped out of the facility, at a fee of £1,000 for an hour's work, 12 cleaners left the place spotless before the first passengers arrived for the morning flight. Section G, on the buses. Only the driver had a seat belt, the guards travelled together on the last bus, and left instructions with the hired goons, to keep order on the other buses. A total of four buses formed the convoy, the first three overloaded and travelling at excessive speeds. On one particular hairpin turn, several occupants were forced to the floor and crushed. The drivers were protected with separate driving cubicles that featured an enclosed space that could not be accessed without a computer code. However much the passengers banged on the doors, there was no way of stopping the drivers. All of the drivers had been hired on the same basis as everyone in the organization, 
Yet, as time was a pressing issue, and this role was not considered priority and corners were cut, one of the drivers took this revenge thing too much to heart and drove his bus to the top of a hill, breaking away from the main group. There at the top, he alighted the vehicle and lit a cigarette, bidding good night to those inside. He gently raised the handbrake and the bus plunged downhill a good 30 meters before sliding of the side of the road and down the side of a gorge. The other buses only realized the other bus was missing when they arrived at the camp. The camp was supposed to be the festival site. All they could see as they now left the buses were makeshift tents devised to house up to six people. Twelve people were designated to each tent. Inside there was a loaf of bread, a packet of processed cheese and three bottles of water. On site the guards were aided by the ground staff who helped maintain order. The groups were arranged, the decision was made that as the last bus had not arrived, that the ratios were still applicable, so seven tents were burned, that would have accounted for the 84 people, that perished on said bus. The sums had to be retouched as quite a few groovy young things also lost their lives due to crushes on the bus ride. Once everyone was accounted for, who was still alive, the remaining 132 festival goers were allowed into their 13 tents. Here was the first lesson of day two. In no tent was the bread, cheese and water spread equally. Only those who fought at each tent had a cohort who reported to the ground staff, pointing out the weakest elements for the next phase of the festival. Alex sat at his desk aghast at developments, barking at the ground staff that it would have been acceptable to lose a few as collateral damage, but nearly half on the first night was not tolerable. The live transmission was visible to everyone at home, and Alex knew things had gone beyond resolution when he was told that the original plan was deemed void, and that they were all having too much fun to stop now. Those who had not eaten were frogmuched barefoot away from the tents as punishment for not putting up a fight. The remainder of the tents were then sprayed with ice-cold water as the internees shivered as the sun came up pitifully. Even in less than 24 hours, many young, healthy specimens were at breaking point. The guards and ground staff wanted to see how far they could push them. Alex was now where he had to inform the authorities, he did not know how, but knew that his plan had gone awry. As he planned the words in his head, whilst heading for the private jet to Iceland, he saw that the team announced that in two hours they would begin live streaming the event on YouTube. Alex managed to get up into the air, and an hour away from Iceland, when the stream was up and running. Now people were horrified as they saw, 